So we spent some time talking about photosynthesis and cellular respiration. And like Irvin said, part of the carbon cycle has to do with growing plants from seeds in the ground. Well, it also, the carbon cycle also has to do with the creation of glucose, that glucose in that plant then being eaten by some type of an animal. You can see that happening here. The cows eat the grass that have photosynthesized because they were growing from the ground, absorbing sunlight. They then turn that that glucose molecule, remember, which is a carbon-based molecule, into energy, right? And they release that glucose uh, energy in the body, in their cells. And at the byproduct, you make carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide then, through the process of cellular respiration, gets breathed out every time that cow takes a breath and exhales. Just like us, every time that we burn glucose in our cells, and then eventually exhale, we're exhaling carbon dioxide. We're respiring carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Well, that's just one little piece of the carbon cycle. Because now what we're going to do is we're going to look at how does photosynthesis and cellular respiration fit into an environment as a whole? Once that carbon dioxide releases from an animal like us, like a cow, like a horse, like a dog, like a cat, whatever, it goes into the air. And we want to try to track what happens to that carbon dioxide because we live on a sealed planet. We live on a planet that has an atmosphere that's, if you want to think of it, it's like a sealed container. And so any carbon dioxide we breathe out stays in that atmosphere until it's reabsorbed by plants in the process of photosynthesis. Then it's that carbon dioxide gets converted into a different carbon form, which we call glucose. And then it goes back into animals when they eat those plants and then the carbon dioxide eventually gets turned back into the atmosphere. But that's not the only place that carbon dioxide goes. Sometimes it just stays up in the atmosphere. Now, why do we care about this? Well, carbon dioxide has the ability to block heat from leaving our planet. It has the ability to let heat in but not let heat out. And remember, we have a big flaming star really close to us, the sun, that's constantly bathing us in light and heat. We want to be able to absorb the heat we need on the planet and then reflect the heat we don't need back out into space. But if there's a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we can't do that. And we create a problem which we call global warming literally the warming of our planet, our globe. And since we know carbon dioxide is this warming blanket in our atmosphere, we want to take some time to look at what happens to carbon in our environments and pay attention to where the carbon is in our environments. And so we're going to now take this photosynthesis and cellular respiration talk a step further. And we're going to look at photosynthesis and cellular respiration in a big environment like our biosphere, a planetary environment. And we're going to see that carbon in the form of carbon dioxide or glucose can take different forms. And not only can it take form of glucose inside of a plant, not only can it take the form of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that carbon dioxide can get absorbed into our oceans and hang out in those oceans, changing the acidity of those oceans. It can also be concentrated in old dead organic material, old dead plants and animals that we find deep, deep, deep in the ground we call fossil, flu fossil fuels. Excuse me. Now, some of you may or may not have heard of fossil fuels before. Can anybody tell me 
an example of a fossil fuel that we use in our daily life. Every time you go to the store with your, uh, oh, well, I don't wanna say that. Um, every time you go a long distance from your home, if you're not walking, you're using this fossil fuel to help you get you there. If you have to go really far, let's say you want to take a trip to Las Vegas, are you going to walk? Yeah, right, they'll say. Or probably not, no. So how would you get there? Dulce says in a car. Irvin says in a car or a plane, right? I agree. I certainly wouldn't want to walk. Now, why am I bringing this up? What does this have to do with carbon dioxide and fossil fuels? Well, that car, that plane has this engine that has fuel. That fuel gets burnt. You get a little bit of an explosion inside of an engine, it causes the piston to move and it causes the wheels to move. Inside of a plane, same idea, but it's more of like a circular motion. But nonetheless, something has to get burnt. That thing that get, that's getting burnt is old dead plant and animals. When you go into a car, that gasoline that's powering that car is what we call a fossil fuel. It's literally made of old dead uh, plants and animals that have been crushed underneath large pressures of rock. And so over time we get all the sediment that builds up and we'll be, you'll be seeing this more in the simulation. And these plants and animals that didn't get eaten, that didn't get consumed by the environment, get crushed underneath layers of rock. And over millions of years, they turn into oil, crude, which we then turn into gasoline and we burn it. Well, if that's dead plant and animal material that we're burning, didn't that stuff go through photosynthesis at some point? Whether it's an animal that ate those plants a million years ago, or whether it's plants that have been crushed underneath a lot of weight millions of years ago, there's a lot of glucose in there. A lot of glucose. A lot of carbon. And so we burn to get energy, just like what we do in our bodies in cellular respiration when we burn a glucose. So when we burn things like fossil fuels like gasoline like petroleum like oil we release the carbon dioxide the carbon back into the atmosphere and so if you have plants pulling in the carbon dioxide turning it into glucose but then eventually the animals eating releasing the carbon dioxide in addition to us grabbing the dead plant material and burning it we're getting a lot of carbon dioxide into the environment and so we call this circular cycle the carbon cycle and we're going to be spending the entire day learning about the carbon cycle so how are we going to do that well we're going to first read some vocabulary together and that vocabulary is going to help us with a gizmo. That gizmo is a, a simulation of carbon moving through ecosystems, moving through our environment. And we're going to get to see where that carbon can move, whether it's being photosynthesized, whether it's being uh, processed or burnt through cellular respiration or burnt through another way. So let's go to gizmo, oh, excuse me, let's go to our vocabulary first. So please go to the course modules and let's go to 
Let me do this. Let's go to the student view. Let's go to modules. And you'll see I've only published one thing for you so far, which is the carbon cycle vocabulary. I haven't opened up the gizmo yet for you. It will be there in a moment. Please click on the carbon cycle vocabulary for now. Now, what you'll see on your page is some vocabulary. And what I want to do with you is take some time to read through some of this vocabulary so that when we jump into the gizmo, you have a little better understanding of why we're doing this. Because we want to get an idea of what happens to carbon throughout its existence in our biosphere. So, the first word we come across, and we're going to come across, is what we call the atmosphere. The atmosphere is just the gas surrounding our planet. So when we're breathing right now, we're breathing in atmosphere. We're exhaling atmosphere. If you look outside, you can't see the atmosphere, but you can see light reflecting off of our atmosphere. That's actually what's making the sky blue. And our atmosphere consists of about 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 1% argon, and then smaller amounts of other gases. So this is where we see carbon dioxide, and this is where we also see methane. Methane we're going to learn a little bit more about. It's another carbon molecule, CH4, so it's one carbon surrounded by four hydrogens, and it's also an important molecule in the carbon cycle. So these two molecules are both incredibly important to our discussion. It's weird. It should be over here. Then there's this word biomass. So this is basically the total mass of uh, a group of living things. So if you just talk about one particular organism, krill, which this is an image of uh, Alaskan krill. Excuse me, Antarctic krill. I'm confusing my, my poles. If we wanted to know how much krill is in the Antarctic Ocean, surrounding Antarctica. We would do some type of approximation based on a sample that we took in the ocean, and we would have a particular amount of krill. But we would say that there would be a certain amount of weight of krill. So let's say the biomass of Antarctic krill is about 500 million metric tons. A metric ton is equal to about 1,000 kilogram or about 2,205 pounds. So it basically means of one organism, what's how many of them are there? But we don't talk about them in terms of a number. We talk about them in terms of a weight. Now, you guys have already come across the word biosphere before. Remember, the biosphere is just all the living things on our planet. The carbon reservoir, this is something you'll come across a lot in our simulation. It's a part of the earth that stores carbon. So an example of a carbon reservoir would be the atmosphere. So where did the carbon go after it was burnt inside of our cells? Well, it goes in the atmosphere. That's carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide can also go back into the ocean. So that's another carbon reservoir. It can go back into the soil. It can go back into sediments. That's where we find the fossil fuels. And then it can be anywhere in the biosphere. So we call these carbon reservoirs, some place that the carbon is being held. A carbon sink, on the other hand, is a carbon reservoir that absorbs carbon from the atmosphere and then stores it a really long time, like those fossil fuels in the ground are carbon sinks. They hold on to carbon for a long time, and they don't let it release up into the atmosphere. Fossil fuel, like we talked about, is a fuel formed over thousands or millions of years from the remains of living organisms. Some examples of fossil fuel are coal, natural gas, petroleum. The geosphere, this is the rocky, non-living parts of the planet. So we have the biosphere, 
these are the living things, the living parts of the planet. The geosphere is the non-living parts, the rocky parts of our planet. The Earth's geosphere contains rocks, it contains sediments, it contains soil. Then we have, and this is just alphabetical, we have greenhouse gas. This is a gas in the Earth's atmosphere that absorbs and then re-radiates heat. Carbon dioxide and methane are both greenhouse gases. They absorb and then re-radiate heat back down to the planet. So it's almost like having a blanket in our atmosphere, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Our planet would be really cold, too cold for life if we didn't have these gases in our atmosphere acting as greenhouse gases. Now, the hydrosphere, very similar to the geosphere and the biosphere, is the part of our planet made of water. So lakes, rivers, oceans, glaciers. About 97% of Earth's water is found in our oceans. Then, just like the hydrosphere, the geosphere, and the biosphere, we have another sphere we name called the lithosphere. This is the rigid upper layer of the Earth. So it's like the crust of our planet. And then, of course, photosynthesis which you guys should know by this point. It's a process in which plants use energy from light to change carbon dioxide and water into glucose, which is sugar and oxygen. Okay. So let me release the gizmo for you, and then let's get started with some warm-ups here. So we're going to spend the rest of the period working through a gizmo. And I'm going to help you with the warm-up, and then I'm going to set you free to go and work on the activities. We will probably not be getting to this. So please go to Canvas in the modules, and if you don't see the Carbon Cycle gizmos, then you're going to need to refresh. And the refresh button is right there. And see, I don't see it, so I'll have to refresh. And actually have to get out of this view. I think that's the problem. Yeah, I have to reset the student view. Then we'll go to modules. Okay. Where are you? Right, let me try to fix this, guys. Hold on. Oh, okay. That's why. Okay, let's go back to student view. And modules. There it is. Okay, so in the heading of the carbon cycle, you will see right above the carbon cycle vocabulary now, the carbon cycle gizmos. So please click on that. And you'll see there's some directions. You're going to open up the Google Doc title Carbon Cycle Student Exploration, and you're going to copy it into your Google Drive. Move the file into your ecology folder in the environmental science folder. If you don't have these folders, that's okay. It's just a recommendation. Read the directions and follow them carefully. Don't forget to complete the assessment in gizmos when you are done with the student exploration. When complete, create a shareable link. Set the permissions correctly. Copy and paste the shareable link into the URL box below. You see that by clicking the Submit Assignment button. So let's go here. Let's make a copy. And you'll see, here's one of these student explorations. I've gone through and I've 
made some edits to it, but be aware that you get to the simulation, and I've kind of cleaned up my other canvas directions a little bit. You get to the simulation by clicking right here on the title. But let's not do that just yet. Let's follow the instructions to go through the simulation, respond to the questions and prompts in the orange boxes. We just went over this vocabulary. If you need those definitions again, they are in the modules. Let's answer these questions. So prior knowledge questions. Do these before using the gizmos. In the process of photosynthesis, plants take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and water from the soil. Using the energy of sunlight, plants build molecules of glucose and oxygen. How do plants on Earth affect the amount of carbon in Earth's atmosphere? What do we think? How do plants affect the amount of carbon in the atmosphere? Do they increase the amount of carbon in the atmosphere or do they decrease the amount of carbon in the atmosphere? Tell me what to write. Do they increase the amount of carbon in the atmosphere or do they decrease it? Remember, they're able to take carbon dioxide from the air with the help of water from the ground, turn it into glucose and keep it inside that plant. Are we increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere or are we decreasing it? Dulce says decrease. What other thoughts do we have? Come on, guys, take a guess. Don't make dual say do all the work here. Oh, and Irvin was participating before, too. If plants are taking carbon dioxide from the air, and then turning it into glucose. Hilan, thank you, says decrease. Yeah, I would agree with you guys. Decrease the amount of carbon in the atmosphere because they're storing it now in the plants in the form of glucose. Started The carbon was in the form of carbon dioxide in the air. Gets absorbed in the plant now and is glucose because of photosynthesis. So it's now stored in that plant. Animals eat plants and produce carbon dioxide and water. How do animals affect the amount of carbon in Earth's atmosphere? Thank you, Irvin. Do they in, do the animals increase the amount of carbon? in the atmosphere or decrease it. Talking about animals now. Remember, animals eat plants or other animals and the glucose goes into the cells, right? That's a carbon molecule. And then when we burn that glucose molecule, we then create carbon dioxide that we have to breathe out into the atmosphere. So are we increasing or decreasing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. So Irvin and Hilan both say decrease. Ah, Irvin says increases. So if you're breathing out carbon dioxide, aren't you adding carbon to the atmosphere? Right, Irvin? So we increase the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. That's what we animals do. Plants decrease the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. We animals increase it. 
So this is an important thing to keep in the back of our minds. Yes, thank you, Natalie. And don't feel bad that we do that. That's just what we have to do to stay alive. We just need to be aware of it. Okay, so let's do our warm-up. So the carbon cycle gizmo allows you to follow the many paths of an atom of carbon can or atom of carbon can take through Earth systems. To begin, notice the black carbon atom in the atmospheric CO2 area, highlighted in yellow. The glowing blue areas represent possible locations the carbon atom could go next. So let's get to our gizmo. And you may need to log in at this point. You may have already logged in, and I just realized I haven't even assigned this to you yet in Gizmo. So give me just a moment, guys. I knew there was something I was forgetting. Shoot. Okay, here we go. So when you click on that link, it will take you here. And there's a lot going on. But what we need to be aware of first is this atmospheric carbon. That black dot represents carbon. That's all we need to know so far. So let me split my screen. And I would use dual list, but it always messes up on my computer because I have two monitors and I have tons of tabs open and it would just be a mess. So let's do it this way. Okay, so here's the gizmo simulation. Here's the student exploration. And I'm gonna talk for just a little bit more and then I'm gonna let you guys work. So the glowing blue areas represent possible locations for the carbon. This is glowing, right? Let's reset this. And so this is glowing blue. That's not glowing, so that's not where it can go. 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 So from Earth's atmosphere, when can the where can the carbon go next? So we know it can go to oceanic. Oh jeez. Ah. Oceanic CO2, or to the ocean, let's just call it the ocean. It, let's see, where else can it go? It can go to the land plants. It can go to the exposed rocks. Okay, so click on the land plants and read the description. How did the carbon atom get from the atmosphere to the plant? What process allows plants to absorb atmospheric carbon dioxide? Thank you, Anthony. Come on, guys, we spent like two weeks on this. In the process of photosynthesis, plants use the energy of the sun to form glucose and oxygen from carbon dioxide and water. Remember photosynthesis? Through photo synthesis that's how the atmosphere carbon dioxide gets into the land plants right through photosynthesis okay then it says select land animals because now we can see a couple other locations that the carbon can go now well, let's just click land animals okay land animals consume plants Oh, okay. How did the carbon get from the land plants to the animals? Well, animals consumed 
which means eat, remember. Plants. So remember, we talked about energy moving. Now we also have to pay attention to where the carbon's moving too. Now we click atmospheric CO2. How did the carbon atom get from land animals back to the atmosphere? Well, let's read it. Land animals to atmospheric CO2 in the process of cellular respiration. Oh, hey, look at that, guys. Remember that? Animals and plants break down glucose to produce energy. That's how. They release carbon dioxide and water into the atmosphere. So how did the carbon atom get from the land animals back to the atmosphere? Through cellular respiration. Now, if any of this is confusing to you, maybe you haven't been paying attention to the work you've been doing. Pay very careful attention to what it's telling you in these descriptions, okay?